So Dr. Metcalf did his undergraduate work at MIT, where he earned two degrees, one in electrical engineering and another in industrial management. After MIT, Dr. Metcalf went to Harvard, where he earned his master's and ultimately his doctorate. The same year that Dr. Metcalf received his doctorate, he invented Ethernet with David Boggs. Several years later, he founded a company called 3Com, which many of you probably know. Apart from the invention of Ethernet, my generation knows Dr. Metcalf best for Metcalf's Law, which states that the value of a network is relative to the square of the number of users. This law is now taught at universities around the world and debated as well, and this is in fact how I first learned of Dr. Metcalf. After contributing to the mega success at 3Com, Dr. Metcalf has been a writer and an investor. President Bush also recognized him in 2003 with the National Medal of Technology. Today he serves as the venture partner at Polaris Venture Partners. And this past January, Dr. Metcalf was appointed as the Professor of Innovation at the University of Texas. So the UT community and I now know him as Professor Metcalf. If you ran into Professor Metcalf on UT's campus today, you would find a professor eager to mentor and quick to convince his students that something they start in Austin, Texas can one day change the world. It's now my pr privilege to introduce to you Professor and Dr. Bob Metcalf. Hi to y'all. You can tell someone who's new to Texas because they say y'all a lot. So um, uh, welcome fellow uh, startup enthusiasts. I assume you're startup enthusiasts and you didn't just come for the free food and drinks. I noticed the people who bought you the drinks didn't get very much applause. That means you're a very hard or ungrateful audience. I don't know which, but thank you. Uh, Anyway, it's my honor to be a, a warm-up act for the startups to follow, and I'm a startup enthusiast, a professional startup enthusiast, and we have five beauties here that you're going to hear about later. But Larry asked me to talk for 25 minutes. Ooh, right, 25 minutes. Here, let me get the timer going here. Stopwatch. Start. There we go. To talk for 25 minutes on vision related to startups, which I'm happy to do. Of course, as soon as I think of vision, I think of Steve Jobs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Steve Jobs later. We'll come back to that. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not using PowerPoint. I was on the board of the company that developed PowerPoint. We sold it to Microsoft in 1987 for $14 million. So I have a lot of experience not using PowerPoint. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to say in case I run out of time. I'm going to explain briefly why I get to talk about vision with y'all. I'm going to talk about this bubble we have in innovation with social angel incubators, startup things. Have you all heard of those? They're the rage right now, um, and it's a lot of fun. But there are other startups I want to talk about too, for example, in energy. So not all life's problems can be solved with a new website. Let's, uh, and then I'm going to talk about vision, uh, which I learned uh, at the feet of Steve Jobs, my hero. And then I'm going to try a little vision myself and describe a, th a way of thinking about the future of the Internet. Is comms mean the Internet to you? It does to me. I've unified comms. I've converged them, so I think of them as the same thing. So the future, I have a nine by, a three by three matrix that I use to think about the future of the Internet, which I'll share with you. And then we'll do Q&A. Is that okay? What, should we proceed on that plan? Unless someone would like to alter the agenda? So I guess I get to be here talking about startups because I did one. Um, does anyone remember 3Com? It, exi you know, it existed, uh, so the, a short story is I, I started working on the internet in 1970, did Ethernet in 1973, and then founded 3Com in 79. It went public in 84. It did 5.7 billion in 1999. Of course, everybody did 5.7 billion in 1999. 
And then it, after 30 years, it became part of the Hewlett Packard Company just last year. So having done that, I mean, 3Com was before the dots. And there's two sets of dots it was before. It was before the IEEE dots. So 3Com was founded with Project 802. And then that you, some of you remember Project 802.3.4.5. And now we have dot 11 and dot 15. And so 3Com was way before the dots, but then it was also before the dot coms. Uh, so I missed that opportunity. I didn't get the 3.com URL when I had a chance. So then after 3Com, I was a pundit for 10 years and then a VC for 10 years, but now I've begun, as you just heard, my fifth career, a 10-year career as professor of innovation. Uh, associated with that is that I'm fellow of free enterprise, which I think is a much cooler title because it expresses my belief in the efficacy of free enterprise and, of course, startups. And what we teach at UT more and more now is how to operate the machinery of free enterprise, that is, how to get your startup going and, and uh, get the free enterprise system to work for you. Now, innovation uh, is a complicated topic, so I'm focused on what I call the Dorio ecology. It's a 65-year-old system by which we do startups in America, and I named it after George Dorio, who allegedly, uh, you can argue about this for hours, I won't. He started the first modern venture capital company 65 years ago, American Research and Development. Uh, the first company he invested in was DEC. Does anyone remember DEC? <laughs> the PDP-10? Anyway. So this ecology, and I call it an ecology rather than an innovation system because it's too complicated and messy to be a system. So it must be one of those things that evolves. And it has, roughly speaking, six key uh, species that uh, create startups and innovation using startups. And those six species are research professors, graduating students, of course we wish they would graduate more often, Steve Jobs didn't graduate, for example, but it didn't stop him. Uh, scaling entrepreneurs, of which there are a lot in Silicon Valley and here in Austin. Venture capitalists and angel investors, if you insist, who invest. Um, and then strategic partners, which are key in startups, we teach. And then also early adopters. Early adopters are my favorite species, because I went to Germany and tried to sell Ethernet to Germany, and they kept asking me if I was from Siemens. <laughs> and then I went to Japan and tried to sell Ethernet, and they said, do you work for Nippon Electric Company? But I managed to find early adopters in the United States, and that's a, uh, an asset we have in the U.S. innovation system that we should cherish, enjoy, and encourage. So there's that uh, ecosystem, which it, I'm aiming to study for the next 10 years uh, as part of my research as a professor. But now that, you know, I was very lucky because I decided to be specialized in innovation and go meta on innovation at exactly the same time that the world decided that innovation was going to solve everything. You know, we have this uh, economic, let's call called a recession, and we need jobs. So every, and they don't mean Steve Jobs when they say that. They mean like employment. And uh, so politicians and almost everybody else talks innovation all the time as if innovation is going to get us all these jobs. Uh, the thing, and they're right about that. Innovation will get us jobs. It's just that it won't get them in the same time frame that they think. They, they think somehow they can just innovate and suddenly there's going to be jobs tomorrow. And where I saw this um, most vividly is one of our uh, startups, one of my startups has uh, some government money and they call every month to ask, how many jobs have you created? So they say, well, we recruited two technicians this week and a receptionist. And they write that down, and they're reporting up the line to how many jobs were created by this grant. Well, this particular grant is going to result in a lot of jobs, but just not this decade. I mean, it's going to take time for that technology to uh, progress. So, so innovation is a fad. You hear it a lot. And I use fad in the positive sense like a hula hoop, and social networking is a fad at the same time. So following the great success of Facebook and Twitter et al., now all the startups are social. Well, at least the ones that are getting funded are social. So that's why I keep telling my energy companies, you should be social solar, and then you'll, you'll find it easier to raise money. 
And because of the structure of social networking companies, that is, they don't require a lot of money, angels are now the rage, and they constantly disparage venture capitalists until the B round, and then they need us. And then incubators are hot. Incubators have come and gone over the decades. So they're here now. My own company has four incubators or accelerators, or you just heard it from Michael, the Dream at Accelerator in New York is a great example. There's a bunch of those, and they're just so much fun. My suspicion, my worry about the incubators is that in this ec ecological system we've got, they tend to breed companies whose purpose is to win business plan competitions, which could be different from companies who will eventually be successful in the real world. I'm, I worry about that. Uh, so, um, so I'm worried about the, mostly now the star, uh, startups that are not website startups. I, I'm joining all the website people, but I also like to worry about the energy. So I'm a, I have five energy companies that I do, none of which is a new website. So I'm, I'm advocating that we pay more attention to the non-website startups. Um, and I'm also worried about what's going to happen after the innovation bubble bursts. The energy bubble, the global warming energy bubble has burst. And it's terrible because we need to solve energy, but the bubble has burst, which is uh, slowing us down. So you've been reading about Solyndra, no doubt, yes? So there's a terrible failure. And it's, it's making it very difficult for energy companies because that energy bubble has burst. So naturally, I'm concerned about what happens when the innovation bubble bursts, which is, you know, inevitable. Eventually, the press will get tired of touting innovation, and then they'll turn, as they always do. You know, having been a pundit for 10 years, I know about this. You just tout something until you run out of articles to write, and then you just start attacking it. So, the, so uh, innovation is uh, doomed. But I'm worried about what we're going to, because we need to keep innovating after it's done being a bubble, and I'm sort of worried about that. And the secret weapon, that I'm bringing to this stems from uh, Metcalfe's Law. But I need to explain uh, something before it confuses you. So 3Com was a, a networking startup. It, the secret weapon that I'm now pursuing as a professor is startup networking. That is, my theory is that the fate of startups to a very large degree depends on the networks that they form. Uh, customer networks, investor networks, uh, uh, technical staffing networks. And so I'm focused now on getting the networks of startups functioning, because that's my theory, that, that startups depend on their networks. So that's not networking startups, that's a startup networking and my uh, secret weapon. So there I was, here's a story about uh, startup networking and vision all in one. So I'm sitting in my apartment in Boston. I had two apartments then, one in Boston and one in Palo Alto. And I'm sitting alone at night at my Selectric typewriter. Does anyone remember what a Selectric typewriter was? So I wasn't, I wasn't browsing the internet that evening in 1979. I was typing shit on my typewriter. And it's a lonely job, and it was a, it was a modern one. It was a correcting Selectric. So if you, if you made a mistake, you could erase it. That was cool. And the phone rang. And I picked it up, hello. And it was a young man who introduced himself as Steve Jobs. And uh, he said he was from a company called Apple Computer in Cupertino. I said, oh, I said, I've never heard of that. Could you tell me a little bit about it? And he told me a little bit about his little company that he was starting. And his interest in calling me is that he had heard I was a networking expert, and he felt that Apple needed to do networking eventually, although their specialty then was the standalone PC. His vision was eventually they would be networked, and since I was a networking guy, he was looking for me. And he invited me to Cupertino. And since I was spending a week on each coast back then, starting 3Com, um, I got down to Cupertino, and we had lunch at Hobie's Restaurant on Stevens Creek Boulevard, and he put the, uh, the rush. He wanted be the, me to be the networking guy at Apple. But unfortunately, I had just incorporated my new company, so I had broke the news to Steve. And I, you have to mind, remember, I'm doing this in Steve's reality distortion field. You've heard that, you've heard that phrase applied to Steve? Well, there I was in it at Hobie's Restaurant. just 
uh, seeing everything different, that as I was seeing Steve's vision, of course, when you get about 30 or 40 feet away, you know, there's an R squared rule and you <laughs> escape the field. <laughs> but even in that field, I had the courage. Hey, you know, I'm looking down at this slide. Is my name misspelled on the slide? <laughs> Could we fix that? Because it's, it, I just noticed it. You know, the E on the end of Metcalf is an honorific. Most Metcalfs don't have the E on the end. But if you invent Ethernet, eventually they give you the E. <laughs> so I went to Cupertino and in, amidst the reality distortion field, explained to Steve that I'd started my own company and that I didn't... <laughs> Thank you very much. I didn't want to join Apple, but I had this idea for networking his computers, and I called it Orchard. <laughs> See, there's a little glimmer of marketing there. So Steve was very impressed that I called the network Orchard, and uh, what he did after I turned him down was he recruited Bob Belleville, who, a guy who had worked for me at Xerox, who became the, um, the head engineer on the Macintosh. And Bob immediately put in a cheap Ethernet into the Macintosh, which was called Apple Talk. It was sort of Ethernet divided by 40. So I missed the chance to design Apple Talk by that stupid lunch. And, but then Steve did something else. And this you might find surprising. Steve said, hey, so you're starting this company. There's some people I want to introduce you to. And he dragged me down onto Lytton Avenue in Palo Alto to a a business called Regis McKenna uh, Advertising and Public Relations. So the first guy he introduces me to is an advertising and PR guy, which gives you some hint of where Steve was going. And then he introduced me to Bob Noyce, who I should have known already, an MIT alumnus who had founded Intel. And through that network, so Regis McKenna became the, 3Com had a PR firm before it had a VP Engineering. And then, we, uh, uh, and then we had Bob Noyce as our angel investor. So he, our first round of investment in 1981 was led by Bob Noyce's angel group. Now don't tell that to the angels because it'll go to their head, but there were VCs involved too. I mean, people who have you know, serious money. Uh, so that, there you see what benefited me was Steve shared his network with me and a, and a vision of um, networking personal computers. Uh, Steve, um, uh, became my buddy for a while, and uh, he attended our wedding in 1980. You don't want Steve Jobs to come to your wedding. Because <laughs> no one remembers anything that happened at that wedding other than the fact Steve Jobs was there. So, I think her name is Robin, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and then Steve, I remember once Steve called and he said, you gotta come over. And so I went down to Cupertino, and he had the Apple II there, and he showed me this array of little boxes, and he started typing numbers and formulas into them, and he showed me VisiCalc, which was brand new, and Steve said, this is the killer app for the Apple II. And of course, that proved out to be true. I, being an engineer, had never seen a spread, not even a real spreadsheet before, let alone an electronic one, so I didn't get that for quite a while, although 3Com's initial business plan was, uh, uh, did use VisiCalc. He, the VCs wanted uh, five years showing 50 million in revenue. So I gave them 60 months, because I didn't know how to consolidate, so I gave them 60 months of a series of products. And the way I did that is I had a summer, uh, a little square over here that was a ton, the sum of all the revenue here. And I just kept adding products until it hit 50 million. <laughs> and then I sent it to him. Uh, I'd like you to join me in wishing Steve Jobs well. So I got the vision thing from Steve and um, it had a lot to do with the success of 3Com Corporation. When I retired from 3Com in 1990, they put a plaque on the brand new headquarters 
and I, they did not ask me to approve the copy on the plaque. I said, I don't know where they got this. But it said on the plaque, the only difference, no, the only way you can tell the difference between being stubborn and being visionary is whether or not you are right. <laughs> I don't know why they chose that. <laughs> so now let me share with you in the closing uh, minutes of this 25, let me see if I can visionate for a minute here. So we're talking about visions for the future of comms or of the internet. And I'm a plumber. So I've always operated at level one and two, maybe three. On a good day, they'd let me up to level four. Um, so my visions of the internet all come from traffic. So this three by three, I'm, I, now this would, it would really be handy to have PowerPoint at this moment, but I'm gonna do it in the air now instead. So imagine a three by three, and the vertical axis is gonna be the new forms of traffic that are invading the internet. And then the horizontal three are going to be the next three huge industries to be disrupted by the internet. And so the, the three by three is you then look in those boxes and you'll look for opportunities. How will this kind of traffic affect that industry? And so now let me fill in the axes. The traffic are, uh, and these are forms of traffic that were not envisioned in the early days of the internet. So first one's video. I can assure you, when we were building the internet in 1970-something, no one was thinking of YouTube. We were th the bold move we were going to make was to upper and lower case. <laughs> so the new form of traffic is video. The second new form of traffic, these are obvious, is mobile. The internet was designed for ASR33 teletypes, which are very heavy, and you can't carry them around. And now we have a mobile internet, and that's new traffic, and it's got a long way to, and maybe you think it's already here, but it's just beginning now. We're beginning to figure out how to do mobile. And the third kind is embedded traffic. There are 10 billion microprocessors shipped every year, microcontrollers, 10 billion, roughly. I made that number up. It's, it's like 10 to the 10th, but it could be 10 to the 9.6 or something, but anyway. 10 billion microcontrollers are shipped every year, and very few of those are networked. That's the embedded traffic, is the traffic that flows among these embedded microcontrollers. And they're just beginning to get networked, and that traffic is getting out onto the internet now. You see it in energy management especially. So that begins the vertical axis. So we have these three kinds of new traffic invading the internet, and then there are the next three industries that really seriously need disruption. The first of these is energy. You agree energy needs fixing. Despite the fact the bubble has burst, its energy still needs to be solved. Second one is healthcare. Duh. There is a broken industry, and uh, you can fix that. And the third one is education. And education is uh, also seriously broken. It's already, you know, the, the local schools are losing market share and have been for some time. Now, I think most people what they know, they didn't, most of it, they didn't learn at school. They learned it from their peers, they learned it from television, they learned it from the internet, they didn't learn it at school, and that trend is gonna continue, but we need to, so there, the, that's the three by three. That's, that's what today passes for my vision for the future of the internet, is now you explore that three, be, three by three looking for business opportunities. So for example, uh, video and energy, that little box. Well, my motto is, transport bits, not atoms. So you don't fly, I don't fly to San Mateo, California for my quarterly meeting of Avastar. I use Avastar's um, video conferencing system. I attend by video. I transport my bits instead of my atoms. That saves energy. So that's an example of, of what you would put in one of those boxes in the three by three. Uh, uh, healthcare, well, constant monitoring of your health. That would be sort of mobile, where mobile intersects with healthcare. Now, yeah, do you get those reports that I do on Twitter, people wearing their Fitbit, reporting how many miles they walk today? And, but it could be reporting their blood sugar level or their heart rate or other things that a doctor might be interested in. So that could personalize and mobilize medicine. So that would be another example of one of those three by threes. And then, of course, education. 
um, pretty soon we're not going to need school buildings anymore. So, I mean, UT is busily building, every university I know of is busily building new buildings, but they, they apparently have it wrong because we're going to need buildings less and less as we make education more online, more mobile, more embedded. So that's the vision thing. Uh, so now that you're uh, visionated and warmed up, we should turn to the central show today, which is these five gorgeous startups that you're about to hear. And so let's turn, let's turn to those. Our, oh, no, we're going to do Q&A. We're going to do Q&A. Yeah. But first, I want to thank you for a fantastic talk. So um, tr true to his word, Bob uh, kept to 25 minutes. But he did so because he told me that his answers to questions are very long. Which means that the answers themselves have to be, the questions themselves have to be short. So we have, uh, well, three microphones in effect going around to take questions for Dr. Metcalf. Please, some so questions. I'll, so I'll take, this side. I'll take this side of the room. We'll start over here. He also told me that you can't hold the mic. That's, that's Metcalf's rule, not law. Here uh, since we have the home of Data Point just down the road, 60 miles from us, who came up with ArcNet and were so uh, taught the example of how bad things happen when you won't license your technology and play well with others, how much did your interactions with them, if any, uh, in trying to see if there was any way to work with them or not, drive you into developing Ethernet? So the the question I've never had fully answered is whether they introduced these folks in San Antonio, very famous pioneer. There were two pioneers in local area networks. One was in Minneapolis, Network Systems Corporation, and the other one was San Antonio Data Point. And what I've always wondered is whether they read the Ethernet paper before they came out with ArcNet. And I, I've never heard the answer. Of course, they'd deny it, wouldn't they? So uh, when we formed the IEEE 802 project to standardize well, we formed it to standardize Ethernet. It didn't work out that way because lots of people, IBM and General Motors, introduced their token bus, their ill-fated token bus and token, token rings. It took us 20 years to kill those. Uh, but the dominant, with an installation measured maybe in tens of thousands by then, was DataPoint. So I called, oh, I just blanked on his name. He's the VP of engineering. Uh, Victor Poor. Thank you. So I called uh, Mr. Poor and I said, we have this committee, IEEE 802, and we're going to standardize local layer networks. And what we've all noticed that you have uh, leadership in that area. So we would like you to submit the specifications for ARCnet to IEEE 802. And Mr. Poor, who's a very sweet and smart man, said, I'll have to get back to you. That. To, that's a board level decision. And he, he said, I'll call you back in two weeks. And he did in two weeks. And he said, we've decided that not to submit our specifications to IEEE 802. So that was the end of ARCnet. It went down the tubes. It took 20 years to go down the tubes, because ARCnet uh, didn't die immediately. It, it, it um, in fact, blossomed. So all, all the lands blossomed in the middle 80s. The shakeout occurred toward the end of the 80s. But that ArcNet might have been the standard had they submitted the specs. It might have been, but we'll never know. We'll go to the other side of the room then. Would, would you uh, please give us Metcalf's second, third, and fourth law? What are the three things startups shouldn't do? I already, oh, I know that one. So. Uh, <laughs> In, in the uh, founding of 3Com, I spent a year uh, working my way through the, uh, a network called the, the, it was the Directory of the Western Association of Venture Capitalists. And I would call them up and say, I'm the inventor of this thing. I'm a Stanford, sometimes Stanford professor. I'd like to talk to you about how you start a company. And so I gained 20 pounds doing that. And I learned, I made careful notes in the three reasons why f uh, startups fail. You did ask for three, didn't you? Yeah. One is the uncontrollable ego of the founder. <laughs> you can see why that would be a problem. Two is a lack of focus. That is, you, um, 
you just want to do too much. And uh, companies often die because they don't focus and they try to do too much. And the third is not enough money. And of course, that's very self-serving advice from venture capitalists, but it's also true. Money from somewhere, maybe not venture capitalists. So when I went back to the VCs in 81 with my, uh, no, September of 80, with my business plan, I was careful not to, to address all three of those issues. A, uh, it's more important to me that this company succeed than that I run it. They like to hear that. Two is, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do Ethernet, TCP, IP, and Unix. And we already have the products done, so here they are. And three is, we're raising money from you, so we don't run out. And, they, and so we raised venture capital by not making those three mistakes. Are those, are those the kind of three you wanted? Yep. We'll go to the back here. Nancy, did you have someone back there? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Bob. Um, I was wondering, in your opinion, uh, what is more critical to have uh, good technology or good leadership for a startup? Um, in my practice of venture capital, I concluded that the limiting factor for us, that is we could put more money to work if there were more startup CEOs available. That is ideas and technologies comparatively were, to put a fine point on it, a dime a dozen. And what mattered was, I guess you'd call it leadership. Leadership was the limiting factor. But having said that, you know, I've been to a million meetings where these snooty uh, marketing people say, you know, technology is not important, it's, you know, it's marketing. And uh, that's just not true. Uh, if you've ever tried to sell a product that does not work, it's really hard. <laughs> so it's, it's a sad fact of companies that you have to do everything well, including the marketing, but including the technology too. So we, having answered the question in favor of leadership, I don't want to leave you with the impression that technology is not important. It's, uh, like everything else, very important. You mentioned that the need for space may be declining in the universities. Do you feel that true for office buildings in the commercial sector? And what do you think of Apple's new giant spaceship building at this time? Have I mentioned that I've been wrong a lot? <laughs> I just have a hunch that um, education is about to get debuildinged and that online education is coming and therefore we won't need all these. But uh, there's a lot of people obviously who disagree with that. And I, I, I keep running into companies where I ask them, I run into a lot of companies, and I say, well, where are you located? And they say, well, Fred is in San Francisco, Tom is in Texas, Bill is in London, and uh, Sally is in uh, Ontario. I say, well, how can you do that? And they, it works just fine. So we're going obviously to some evidence is that the virtual world is coming and that would impact office buildings. And, and have you ever been, there's a huge office complex out here that's the IBM office complex and I've been out there a bunch of times. I've, I've reconciled with IBM, you know, following the, the death of Token Ring. <laughs> and, uh, and IBM is my favorite startup. <laughs> it's a hundred years old, just a few weeks ago. So it's, but anyway, when you go to those buildings, they're empty. And the parking lot is empty. And I asked about this. And their answer was, well, there's a lot of people here, but they don't come to work every day. They work at home. So that's some more evidence of the virtualization of uh, the corporation. I was just asked a really sad question, which is the, the fate of Apple post jobs. And uh, um, I refuse to use the past tense in connection with Steve Jobs and Apple. Uh, I'm, I want him to recover and I want him back. <laughs> and the Steve Jobs that returned to Apple was not the Steve Jobs who left Apple. So it was a very surprising development when he came back. And, behaved completely differently and with, as you know, great success. So it's, uh, there are two kinds of people, those who believe that history is sort of the playing out of inexorable forces. And then there's those, the rest of us, who think that history is punctuated by brilliant people who change everything. 
and, and I'm, I'm the second kind, and Steve Jobs would be the prime example, and that doesn't bode well for Apple. But um, maybe he was able to transfer the DNA. Uh, my question, uh, Dr. Metcalf, is um, what are the most important qualities the CEO of a startup should possess? Uh, there's books about that. Um, I'll give you one, which is even harder. Um, so, I've t I've, so we're now teaching, uh, uh, just last t three weeks ago, we started a course at uh, University of Texas at Austin aimed at undergraduates who are starting companies. And uh, people say, isn't that a little early to be teaching people to start companies? And all I have to say is Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, Bill Gates, um, the list goes on. Oh, uh, John Mackey, uh, Whole Foods, all of whom were undergraduates. Mackey and um, Dell dropped out of UT in particular to start their company. So no, it's not too early. But then in trying to think of things that these students should know, my list is this. I have five things I think they should know. First of all, they should know that starting a company requires a lot of energy. So this nonsense of pulling all-nighters constantly and eating ramen noodles and drinking Coca-Cola is a bad idea. You need to get your sleep and eat good food because we need you to be full of energy and not typing bugs into your software because you're uh, delusional. <laughs> Second, you need, to, you need to know how to write. You need to know how to speak. You need to know how to plan. And you need to know how to sell. So I guess, uh, to answer your question, the CEO should know how to do all those things. And now, here's the secret to all of them. One word. Listening. So if you can listen, you can speak better, you can write better, you can sell better, you can plan better, but you must listen. So if I had to choose one word and answer your question, it would be listening, the skill of listening. I re I've recently had trouble with my family where I've, 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 I've a lot asked them a lot to repeat themselves to the point they were annoyed. What would you say? So they proposed, my, they gang up on me occasionally, and they said, you're, Dad, you're losing your hearing. So I went to the doctor. The doctor measured my hearing. And she said, uh, your hearing is just fine. Have you tried listening? <laughs> so that would be the quality that I would recommend. The old, the old saw there is God gave us two ears and one mouth. Take the hint. <laughs> Over this way. Do you see uh, any parallels in the disruptive forces that we're seeing with mobile devices, smartphones, and tablets versus PCs compared to the 80s when the PCs were disrupting that centralized ecosystem? Well, to, to, a, to a person who was uh, born during mainframes and then watched interactive time sharing mini computers revolutionize computing and then watched Network PCs revolutionize computing and then watched what's happening now all the way down to uh, cell phone, smartphones and then embedded microcontrollers. It's just a constant, um, smaller, smaller, many, many more, Moore's Law squared, more and more of smaller and smaller things. So it's, and it's, uh, the, many of the arguments are just recapitulations of earlier arguments. Um, so that's why I put embedded on my list, because embedded's neck. After mobile, you know, the smallest possible personal devices, where do you go? You go to impersonal devices, in the, you know, where the ratio of people to computers is one to a, a thousand instead of one to one. Uh, as a customer-funded Washington, D.C.-based startup, how do we join the uh, Dr. Met Metcalf network? The Dr. Metcalf what? Network. As we were talking about joining networks and expanding from there. 
oh, I, and you're worried that because I was a VC for 10 years, I wouldn't talk to you because you're customer funded? <laughs> yeah. I had a problem during my 10 years as a VC because I would hear all these company pitches and almost my first question is, can't you get a customer to pay for that? And, and then my partners are jabbing me under the table saying, no, we're supposed to give them the money. <laughs> but if you look at Steve, you know, the, the, all the rich people in the world and most successful ones, they got their money from customers. So the uh, Bill, Bill Gates didn't need venture capital. He found a way to get his money from customers. And so I'm, I, I worship at your feet uh, if you can pull that off. Uh, 3Com was customer funded initially and then our competitor Ungerman Bass, if you remember that. Of course you don't, because we slaughtered them, and they're gone. <laughs> but they raised venture capital ahead of us, and I, one, I woke up one day, and they were four times bigger than us, and Ralph Ungerman was bragging that uh, he invented Ethernet, sort of. And that really annoyed me. So then I ran out and got venture capital so that I could catch him, because basically the market was opening up, and with the venture capital fueling his rocket, he was taking off and we were bootstrapping. This may be a warning to you. We were bootstrapping and the market was running away from us. So that, then we went out and got the venture capital and blew past him a couple of years later. Ralph's a good guy. We've made, Ralph and I would have founded one company together, except for two things. One is I beat him at racquetball. And you'd never do that with someone you're going to found a company with. And the other thing is, I, wa I would, of course, wanted it to have been Metcalf and Ungerman. <laughs> you may notice Ungerman Bass is not alphabetical. <laughs> Are we done? We're, 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 we're uh, two, three left. Um, I am really sorry because I think I am going to put you in the spot. Even even though you are already in the spot. And You're going to put me on the spot? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Take your best shot. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I just left this morning from El Paso, Texas. I just catch a fly, and that's it. But I am lucky that you mentioned energy. The way that I see energy, and as a mechanical engineer, I develop renewable energy products. The way that I see energy is that it's going to be distributed. It's not going to be centrally generated. So the question is, you are in the spot. For the product that I am developing, would you please be so kind to share your network with me? Uh, yes, especially since I agree with your, there's a million attitudes you could have about energy, but you remember the question about the recapitulation of um, uh, PCs and then um, smartphones, net pads, all those things? I've gone to energy and used a recapitulation there. So uh, I've given a talk for 42 times, I've given this talk making the analogy between the building of the internet and the solving of energy. And one of the conclusions of that analogous reasoning is that we started with mainframe computers and we ended up with cell phones. We start up with centralized coal, gas, oil, and we're going to end up with distributed energy generation. So you're on, I, you and I are uh, in agreement, so let's, you know, let's uh, merge our networks. Uh, Bob.metcalf at austin.utexas.edu. That will work. Last question over here. Uh, Dr. Metcalf, you've in the past been somewhat um, negative on open source as a concept. At least you were 10 years ago. And I'm kind of curious, with all of the VC, or pardon me, all of the, the venture-backed uh, startups that are, to a large degree, making things work based on open source software, whether you've had a change of heart? Well, yes and no. Uh, do you remember when uh, Linus Torvalds uh, showed up as an employee of Transmeta Corporation? And do you remember that Transmeta had software that was not open source? 
And do you remember when I wrote a column attacking Linus Torvalds for that hypocrisy? Never attack Linus Torvalds. <laughs> so starting with slash dot, and it was the worst thing that I've ever done. And the people who write those emails are brilliant, savage people. <laughs> so I have a change of heart. I think open source is just so cool. And, uh, <laughs> What really annoyed the open source movement is I called it, see, I, uh, I equated it with organic software. And if you've ever bought, bought organic food, you notice that it doesn't look very good compared to those big apples from California. So it sort of has, they have sores on them. So I called it the open sores movement. <laughs> That was really cruel of me to do, but they, I have not been forgiven. Uh, I'd like to point out Windows still exists. Uh, and basically, I've attacked both Windows and Linux uniformly, because I view them both as old technology. And the real question is, which model of uh, effort is most likely to bring us the software that we need? Is it the ragtag uh, volunteer army of the open source movement? Or is it the professional software corporation as personified by Microsoft? And that's, that's a false dichotomy. And what's happened since I drew that false dichotomy is that both of them have sort of come together now. So now you have a, some, so the open source movement today, which I, is different from the one that I attacked, what, 10 years ago, 50, 20 years ago? So I think by now you should have forgiven me. <laughs> I think on that Thanks note, very much. we're gonna close and I wanna thank you. Actually, you can take a seat up here. Thank you. And you can take a seat oh, yes, up here. Right. Yeah. I want to let you know that, that uh, Dr. Metcalf is joining our panel, so it, it could be that some of the outstanding questions will get answered uh, anyway. I'm sorry that we couldn't take them all. Um, when I started to tell people that uh, Bob was going to be our speaker, and I'd never heard him speak, they said, everybody said to me, well, you should feel lucky. I don't know about you, but I feel very lucky now that he was with us tonight. <laughs>